I'm Dr. Joseph M.T. Department of Sociology, University of Mumbai. This is the E. Patishala project on religion and society and we are in module 31. In this module we look at syncretism and religious pluralism in India. Syncretism is a very curious word. Syncretism refers to the way that uh, dif practices, of dif practices belonging to the domain of different religions are, are taken together or are practiced together by certain practitioners. And this is seen as an unfavorable thing in a Semitic kind of uh, a religious background. But in India, it is seen as something that is very much part of Indian culture and favorable. So we look at case studies and we look at examples of this such syncretism and religious pluralism in India in this module. In order to make this study more meaningful, we need to examine the role of power and agency. At stake is the power to identify true religion and to authorize some practices as truthful and others as false. Oxford English Dictionary defines syncretism as the amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures or schools of thought. The Encyclopedia of Social and Cultural Anthropology defines it as the hybridization or amalgamation of two or more cultural traditions. It derives from modern Latin syncretismus, drawing on Greek syncretismos, meaning Cretan Federation. The Greek word occurs in Plutarch's essay on fraternal love in his morals. He cites the example of the Cretans who compromised and reconciled their differences and came together in alliance when faced with external dangers. Syncretism refers to the synthesis of different religious forms. When different religious traditions encounter each other, they often influence and shape each other such that new belief systems and practices emerge. In sociological understanding of religion, syncretism is a contentious and contested term. It has undergone many historical transformations in meaning. Some see it as a negative ethnocentric label for religious traditions, which are considered to be impure or inauthentic because they are permeated by local ideas and practices. Again, diverse local variations of standard world religions such as Christianity and Islam are often pointed to as prime examples of syncretism in this critical sense, especially in the writings of missionaries and theologians. The local syncretistic version of Islam or Christianity may be seen by religious scholars as a deviant form of a religion as compared to its more standardized beliefs and interpretations. Yet in other contexts, religious syncretism may have positive connotations as a form of resistance to cultural dominance, as a link with a lost history, and as a means of establishing a national identity in a multicultural state. In this instance, syncretism is seen in terms of a religious identity, which resists a hegemonic understanding of a belief system. In the present era of displacement, migration, urbanization, global capitalism and generally increasing cultural compression, syncretic processes are multiplied and intensified. A brief history of religious syncretism in the West. As mentioned above, syncretism found to mention in early Greek thought in the works of Plutarch. Syncretism re-emerged as a topic of discussion during the Renaissance, when the rediscovery of classical authors, especially the Greek philosophers Pluto and Aristotle, began to influence the strictly theological readings of Christian texts. Erasmus, one of the most prominent Renaissance scholars of religion, encouraged in his study of Christian theology the influence of classical Greek throughout. He showed this as a positive achievement which strengthened and enriched Christianity. The next historical context of terms usage in the 16th and the 17th centuries reversed its early positive associations. The syncretistic controversy was the theological debate provoked by the efforts of George Calixtus and his supporters to secure a basis on which the Lutherans could make overtures to the Roman Catholic and Reformed churches. It lasted from 1640 to 1686. Calixtus, a professor at Helmstadt in Germany, had through his travels in England, the Netherlands, Italy and France, through his acquaintance with different churches and their representatives, and through his extensive study developed a more friendly attitude towards different religious bodies than the majority of his contemporary Lutheran theologians. Repelled by the horrors of the Thirty Years' War, Calixtus called for toleration and ecclesiastical peace between the confessions on the basis of shared doctrinal foundation. The syncretist strife had the result of lessening religious hatred and of promoting mutual forbearance between Catholicism and Protestantism. Syncretism is not a determinate term for a fixity of uh, meaning. Its implications have changed over different historical periods. Therefore, simply state that religious traditions are syncretic is not very helpful. All religions are manifested through diverse local practices and continuously reconstituted through processes of synthesis. 
In order to make this study more meaningful, we need to examine the role of power and agency. At stake is the power to identify true religion and to authorize some practices as truthful and others as false. If we recast the study of syncretism as the politics of religious synthesis, one of the first issues which needs to be confronted is what we have termed anti-syncretism, the antagonism to religious synthesis shown by agents concerned with the defense of religious boundaries. Anti-syncretism is seen in many nationalist eth ethnic movements that are premised upon a conception of pure identity. Anti-syncretism is also a feature of fundamentalist understandings of religion which would see religious synthesis as the effect of unwelcome foreign percolation in original doctrine. The erasure of syncretism is also entailed by certain forms of multiculturalism in the United States of America. The invention of American identity through the image of the melting pot or the diffusion of different cultures into one homeland seems syncretic. However, the American nation is predisposed towards certain denominators, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant hegemony as well as race relations reveal definite anti-syncretic strain in the USA. Some scholars like Peter van der Weer argue, however, that syncretism and multiculturalism can accommodate each other and are applicable to countries like USA and India. Multiculturalism is a body of thought in, in political philosophy about the proper way to respond to cultural and religious diversity. Mere toleration of group differences is said to fall short of treating members of minority groups as equal citizens. Recognition and positive accommodation of group differences are required through group differentiated rights, a term coined by Bill Kimlicka. Typically, a group differentiated right is a right of a minority group to act or not to act in a certain way in accordance with their religious obligations and or cultural commitments. The enjoyment of such, such rights is the benchmark for measuring how syncretistic a society is and the extent to which it accommodates religious and cultural diversity. Section 2. Syncretism and Religious Diversity in India Religious syncretism in India is encapsulated by the phrase unity in diversity. Indian civilization purports to be an amalgamation of different cultures, religions and languages. The heterogeneity of Hinduism is said to provide a fertile ground for the reception of different religions like Buddhism, Jainism, Christianity and Islam. Religion in India is characterized by a diversity of religious beliefs and practices. The Indian subcontinent is the birthplace of some of the world's major religions, namely Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism. Throughout India's history, religion has been an important part of the country's culture. Religious diversity and religious tolerance are both established in the country by the law and custom. The Constitution of India has declared the right to freedom of religion to be a fundamental right. According to the 2011 census, 79.8% of the population of India practices Hinduism, 14.2% address adheres to Islam, while the remaining 6 adheres to other religions, Christianity, Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism and various indigenous ethnically bound faiths. Zoro Zoroastrianism and Judaism also have an ancient history in India and each has several thousands of Indian adherents. India has the largest population of people adhering to Zoroastrianism and Baha'i faith in the world, even though these religions are not native to India. Many other world religions also have a relationship with Indian spirituality such as the Baha'i faith, which recognizes Buddha and Krishna as manifestations of the divine. The Sufi, the Sufi and Bhakti movements, the edicts of rulers like Ashoka and Akbar, have contributed to a pluralistic understanding of religion. An example of religious eclecticism is the Nilahi, which implies re religion of God in Persian. It was a religious code of ethics formulated by Akbar. It borrowed heavily from Zoroastrianism, making light an object of divine worship and reciting, as in Hinduism, the thousand Sanskrit names of the sun. The essence of the idea of pluralism which naturally follows from the existence of religious diversity is to ensure that every religious or social group is allowed its own cultural space in which it has the right to practice its own beliefs and traditions. The existence of religious pluralism depends on the existence of freedom of religion which is when different religions of a particular region possess the same rights of worship and public expression. Freedom of religion is weakened when one religion is given rights or privileges and denied to others. Religious freedom did not exist in communist countries where the state restricted or prevented the public expression of religious belief and even persecuted the individual religions. 
In some Middle Eastern countries where they adhere to one particular religion, the pluralism is rather restricted if not overtly curbed. As Amar Thyssen writes, being born as Indians, we find ourselves in a culture that has had thousands of years of flourishing diversity, in a community that is proud of its many major languages and literatures, in a polity that tolerates dissent and a substantial heterogeneity of political ideas, and in a country that has persistently tried to make room for different religions, religious and, what is also important to emphasize, diverse non-religious beliefs. What gives pluralism its value is not the fact of its uniqueness in India, but its normative importance in enriching societies wherever it occurs. Religious coexistence in Sufi and Bhakti movements. Sufism as an ideology or form of devotion first developed in Central and West Asia. From where it spread to different directions, most of the Sufis had a deep devotion to God and many of them emphasizes, emphasize upon a simple life away from vulgar display of wealth. Sufism in India existed in the form of several Sufi sects or silsilas, such as the Chisti, Suhravardi and Nashkbandi silsilas. The founder of the Chisti sect, Moinuddin Chisti, was another famous Sufi who came to the Indian subcontinent in 1190 AD. At the popular level, there is considerable interpretation or interpenetration of the religious traditions, especially in tomb worship in Sufi Islam. The sacred power of the saint and his tomb bring people of different communities to forms of syncretism that promote peace and reconciliation. Indeed, syncretism is the most important channel of dealing with religious diversity because it crosses boundaries and allows hybridity, particularly striking at the worship of Muslim warrior saints, Ghazi, by Hindus in India. The story of these warriors is at one level that of conquest, but at a deeper level one of martyrdom that is reminiscent of the faith, death of Jesus Christ on the cross and inspire similar devotion. The term bhakti is defined as a devotion to a personal deity and its origin is traced back to the Vaishnavism or Bhagavatism that developed in post morin period. The soul aims to unite with God, a process which is variously termed as mukti, moksha or nirvana, emancipation from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Bhakti saints like Ramananda, a Vaishnava, opened the doors of bhakti to all and even admitted the devotees from lower castes. Kabir abandoned Sanskrit and composed his hymns in local dialectics, dialects. He took a very radical stand by rejecting idol worship, caste system, pilgrimage, rituals and outward symbols of religious life. He not only attacked the orthodox Brahmanical practices but also Islamic practices like performing namaz, visiting mosques and so forth. Kabir maintained that God resides in devotees' heart, since hence a simple life in a pure manner is enough to know him. Both Sufism and Bhakti as uh, reform movements attempted to redefine social and religious values. Saints like Kabir and Guru Nanak stressed upon the reordering of society along egalitarian lines. The, the interaction between Bhakti and Sufi saints had an immense impact upon, upon Indian society. The Sufi theory of Bahudhat al-Wujud, unity of being, was remarkably similar to that in the, of the Hindu Upanishads. The importance of the Bhakti and Sufi saints lies in the new atmosphere created by them, which continued to affect the social, religious and political life of India even in later centuries. Syncretism between Hindus and Muslims in colonial and post-colonial India the partition of India in 1947 and the continuing violence between Hindus and Muslims in many parts of India is a sharp contrast to the pluralistic notion of Indian civilization. How does syncretism feature in such a divided polity? The answer to this may be found in the congruent yet conflicting notions of civilization and nation. The idea of an Indian civilization figured in its uh, embryonic form in the nationalist writings of R.G. Bhandarkar and Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. It evolved in Mahatma Gandhi's Hind Swaraj and Rabindranath Tagore's essays and reached the pinnacle in Jawaharlal Nehru's dis discovery of India. Gandhi furthered the idea of the assimilative nature of Indian civilization for him. The main issue was the vast difference between the European and the ancient Indian civilization. Gandhi recognized that India was a land of diversity and so he never substituted Indian civilization by Hindu culture or Hindu civilization. Later, the nationalist perspective came to be based on Tagore's view that Indian civilization was syncretic in nature. It was able to create unity among image diversity without obliterating the uniqueness of the elements that composed it. 
in direct opposition to this was the aggressiveness of the Western civilization which tried to forcibly homogenize different cultures, a feature Tagore vehemently opposed. Nehru's position represented a fine blend of Anthean Tagore's. As Peter van der Weyer writes, the notion of the pluralist, tolerant nature of Indian civilization is not only held by India's nationalist leaders, it is complemented by the idea that there is a folk culture or a popular religion in India, which is at grassroots level pluralistic and tolerant. According to Ashish Nandi, the traditional pluralism of India is reflected in religion as faith as compared to religion as ideology. He notes faith in terms of religion as a way of life. He denotes ideology in terms of religion as a sub-national, national or cross-national identifier of populations contesting for or protecting non-religious, usually political or socio-economic interests. Such religions as ideologies usually get identified with one or more texts which rather than the ways of life of the believers then become the final identifiers of the few pure forms of the religions. Nandi and others, other post-colonial scholars, perceive the modern secularizing project of the nation-state as an artificial imposition upon the traditionally plural and syncretic notions of mass religion in India. The secular state in India is blamed for partially allowing this syncretic tradition and unleashing in its stead a political culture that has led to sectarian strife and communal violence. Nandi's view formulates a certain hope that a more positive image of religion can be salvaged from the contemporary nasty facts of rising communal violence in India. A good example of this large advertisement for the Hindu nationalist movement, Vishu Hindu Parishit in the newspaper Times of India, in which Hinduism is described as a religion of humankind as a parliament of religions and the very antithesis to violence, terrorism and intolerance. In the light of this critical study of Indian syncretism, Christopher Jaffrelot examines what he terms as strategic syncretism as the tool to build an ideology of Hindu nationalism. Jaffrelot writes that the religious reform movements in the early 19th century, along with the formation of uh, Brahma Samaj and the Arya Samaj, were examples of strategic syncretism. He argues that reformers like Ram Mohan Roy and Dan and Saraswati wanted to reform as well as salvage Hinduism from the onslaught of Western theological modernity and Christian proselytization. According to Ram Mohan and Dayanand propounded in the golden age of the Vedas where the prevailing social and religious practices were free from the evils of idolatry and rigid caste hierarchies. Jaffrey Lord calls this perpetrated golden age of the Vedas and the invention of tradition by the socio-religious reform movements borrowing the famous coinage of Eric Hobsbawm. Jaffrey Lord writes, Ram Mohan Roy and Dayanand discover in the Vedas what they need to resist the <coughs> Western influences. This is an ideology of strategic syncretism. Syncretism because there is a strong intention to reform one's society through the assimilation of Western values consistent with the Hindu cultural equilibrium. And strategic syncretism since the equilibrium in question remains the prime concern. Jaffrey Lord argues that the sociological base of syncretism being used, to, uh, used as a tool to maintain cultural equilibrium can be located among the upper caste elite. Even if we do not agree with his critique of syncretism, we would see that the reform movements in the colonial era, such as the Arya Samaj, were influenced by the Shuddhi, uh, by the monotheism of Christianity. Here, here the Arya Samajis under the Anand undertook Shuddhi or purification ceremonies to enable converts to return to the fold of Hinduism. These practices go against the pluralist understanding of Hinduism itself. The Hindu nationalism evolved by this. Arya Samajis as an ideology reached its maturity in the 1920s within the Hindu Mahasabha. Islam in India has become woven into a very fabric of Indian civilization and culture. According to his historian Aziz Ahmad, Indian Islam represents the mosaic of demotic, superstitious and syncretic beliefs, which, which, which movements of mass reform like that of the Mujahideen in the 19th century have tried to erase, but not with complete success. The historian Asim Roy describes in his book Islamic Syncretic Traditions of Bengal how syncretism came under attack by Islamic reformist movements in the 19th century Bengal. Finally, anthropologist Imtiaz Ahmad has argued that Islamic theological and philosophical precepts and principles on the one hand and local syncretic elements on the other are integrated in Indian Islam. According to Francis Robinson, however, Imtiaz Ahmad's argument that high Islamic traditions and local syncretic Customs peacefully coexist in one religious system derived from his wish to show that Indian Muslims have their roots deep in the Indian society and that they are therefore good and loyal citizens of India. 
Robinson develops an alternative view by emphasizing a long-term process of Islamization by which local customs were con- infused with new meanings or were ed- eradicated. His interpretation attempts to show the gradual mar- marginalization of syncretic practices and the slow victory of what he calls the pattern of perfection through reform. Sufi shrines in India. The Darga or the tomb of a Sufi saint as a shrine has immense popularity in India. Anthropologist J.J. Roy Berman argues that the cult of saints has been one of the religious steps which has promoted Hindu-Muslim syncretism in India. The proliferation of Sufism in fact became one of the most important mechanisms of ensuring communal harmony between Hindus and the Muslims. What is sociologically relevant is that the many of the local saints were supported only by certain sections of the population determined either by locality, social or professional group. There is thus a sort of a patriarchy and saint relationship. Burman provides an exhaustive account of Sufi shrines all over the country. In Bengal, the syncretic tradition is mainly evident in rural areas, but there are few dargahs in the cities and towns which are frequented even by the Hindus. The Darga of Maula Ali, for instance, in Kolkata, is believed to be frequented more by Hindus than the Muslims. The f- most famous syncretic ritual of West Bengal is perhaps the Satya, Satya Pir Mela, held in Hooghly district, the Pope. The worship of Satinarayan by the Hindus itself is supposed to have been borrowed from the Muslims. In rural Bengal, there are many shrines which are worshipped by the Hindus by one by one name or by another name by the Muslims. The devotional songs of Lala and Pakir, which are eclectically praised elements of Hinduism and Islam, are equally popular among the Hindu and Muslim Bengali Muslims. The Dargah of Khwaja Moedidin Hasan Chisti of Ajmer in Rajasthan is perhaps the most famous shrine of the Western India. His preaching also made a profound impact on the course of Bhakti movement. The shrine of Nizamuddin Awliya in Delhi is perhaps the most famous syncretic shrine after the shrine of Moedidin Chisti of Ajmer. Sufi shrines of India are emblematic of syncretism and synthesis of different religious traditions in India. However, debates among Muslims continue as to whether the worship of a peer or saint is permitted by orthodox doctrine or whether it is an innovation resulting from a contact with Hinduism. Apart from this controversy, the syncretism of Sufi shrines often comes under attack from radical Hindutva outfits who wish to convert the shrine into a more Hinduized space such as that of a temple. For example, in early December 1998, Hindutva brigades organized a series of Rathyatras that crisscrossed the entire length and breadth of Karnataka, culminating in a rally outside the ancient Sufi shrine of Dadar Mir Hayat, Hayat Khalander, high up in the Baba Budhangiri hills of Chikmagalur district. They demanded that the shrine be converted into a Hindu temple and that the present Muslim custodian Sajda Nasheen of the shrine Pir Sayyid Muhammad Shah Kadri be replaced by a Brahmin priest. Another darga with a similar encounter is the darga of Haji Malang Baba located on the hill north of Thane, Maharashtra. The darga has been a pilgrimage site for centuries and its annual fair attracts large crowds of Hindus and Muslims as well. Thomas Blum Hansen has observed that the darga of Haji Malang represents religious syncretism. While the tomb is undoubtedly a Muslim structure, worship at the site is managed by a Hindu Brahmin family. Many of the rites incorporate clearly Hindu elements and worshippers include adherents of both. In this module, we have looked at syncretism and the coexistence of religious identities in India. In a sense, in South Asia and in India, there has been a whole lot of ways in which practices belonging to different religious domains have come together and hybridized in such a manner that people follow these in, in a very hybridized way. In this module, we have looked at how this has played itself out in different places in India. Thank you.